Luton Town exited the FA Cup in pretty ruthless fashion on Tuesday night when we saw exactly why Manchester City are the best football team in the world. Alongside me to review a pretty disastrous night at Kenilworth Road is the Lutonian journalist James Cunliffe and board member of the Luton Town Disabled Supporters Association, Steve Moore. Gents, are we ready to go through it again? Not really, but let's do it. (laughs) Just about. We will recap on a... High scoring night after this intro. Can you believe it? We are Premier League! Yes! I love this town. I love this town. I love this town. This, this, this you know what I love about this town? is actually you. Everyone in it has got this massive soul. We're looting people, and that's what we care about. Hello everyone, welcome along to another episode of the Luton Town Supporters Trust podcast. As I said before the intro, we are looking back at Luton Town 2, Manchester City 6. Steve, just before we start on the game, um, pleasure to have you along. Just introduce yourself to everyone who's listening or watching and hearing you for the first time. Yeah, well, my name's Steve Moore. I'm a board member of the, as you mentioned, the Disabled Supporters Association. And... You said to hear me first time, some of the older members of your listenership may remember my voice, if not my face, from the Diverse FM show from the non-league days. But yeah, that's my background. Excellent stuff. As I say, more than welcome uh, along. It's good to have you with us. Um, James, when we looked at the preview for this game, we wondered whether we would see the full shebang of Manchester City. We'll take Phil Foden out of the equation and we got it both barrels, didn't we? We got anything that's good in that Manchester City side lined up. And as soon as you saw the team sheets, with no disrespect to our players whatsoever, you thought, oh shit. <laughs> to say the least. <laughs> I mean, I couldn't have been the only one whose heart dropped when I saw De Bruyne and Haaland on that team sheet. Because, um, Can I just say at this point, I said in the preview, I quite like to see Barkley against Bro- What a load of horseshit that was. <laughs> no way do I ever want to see that ever again. <laughs> yeah, no, it, I mean, it was, bloody, it was a tough night, wasn't it? But um, yeah, I mean, it was a tough night pretty much from the minute you blinked after kickoff, didn't it? So that didn't help. It's uh, That's got to be rectified somewhere down the line because that's killing... Uh, killing your hopes at the moment because it's yeah, it's one thing to come back against your Newcastles and stuff, but the best team in the world. I mean, they showed it in spades, didn't they? Um, and it was, yeah. I mean, the first half until Clark scored, obviously, um, it was it was so um, quiet and it was really boring. <laughs> I know the people. Have, some people have said like, oh well it's good that you were there and you got to see that and stuff, but I didn't want to. So, um, <laughs> I'm not on the same um, page as those people. I just thought uh, it was difficult. Yeah. In my defense, when I said that I had literally walked in the door at 20 to four that morning from the Liverpool game. So quite what I was thinking. <laughs> Delirious. I've absolutely no idea. Steve, what was you thinking when you saw their team sheet? They obviously gave us maximum respect. There was no rest in anyone. It was, apart from Foden, it was pretty much as good. And they changed the goalkeeper as well, of course. It was pretty much as good as you can get from Manchester City. And they didn't disappoint on the pitch either, did they? Hey, well, I'd have to echo what James said. My heart sank when I saw the Manchester City team sheet. I was speaking all the, well, basically since the draw was made for the fifth round, I, Obviously, we had a few more players at that point in time when that draw was made than we have at the point the game was played. Uh, saying, listen, right, they've got the Manchester Derby at the weekend, at that weekend. They rest a couple, and most importantly, if they rest Kevin De Bruyne, then I think we've got a chance. And generally, if you offer me only one player, it would have been Kevin De Bruyne miles over Haaland and I still echoed that despite the fact he scored five but I'm sure we'll come on to that uh, when I saw De Bruyne actually on the bench at the weekend that's when my heart sank because I knew he was playing at that point but uh, yeah that first half well, in the entire game was difficult other than that little period where we pulled two goals back yeah it was um, yeah I mean Jesus De Bruyne and Haaland 
good luck stopping them. Whoever you are, good luck stopping them. Do you know what, James? I wasn't so much watching De Bruyne and Haaland. I was looking for the bugger who had the PlayStation controller in the, in the ground because I was going to unplug it so that they <laughs> couldn't control them anymore because that's what it felt like. It felt like we were a football team playing against a PlayStation team, only you probably couldn't play as good as that with PlayStation either. Every single time Kevin De Bruyne got the football... I mean, Erling Haaland, when De Bruyne gets the football, Erling Haaland's eyes light up like my eyes light up when there's a KFC bargain bucket on it. (laughs) It was absolutely incredible. And he's just off, isn't he? And there's no stopping him. It's it's like he had the cheat codes for whatever PlayStation game you're mentioned in because, um, you know, I've seen Ted and Mengi bully uh, attackers this season and he couldn't get close to Haaland. He's an absolute monster. I mean, to be fair, when he did get close to him, the referee was like, oi, this is Erling Haaland now, son. That's a foul. (laughs) But obviously at the other end, it's absolutely crack on. I mean, I just, apologies if you've read this in my report, but I just started the report from the the, the match saying, remember when you were 12 years old and you were all little boys playing Sunday league and you played that one team where where one of them was 12, but a full-grown man with a full-grown beard. That's what Erling Haaland's like. He's an absolute monster. (laughs) And yet, Steve, like you just say, I didn't think he was the best player on the pitch. And that sounds stupid when he scored five goals. But Kevin De Bruyne pulled every single string going in the game. If it wasn't De Bruyne, John Stones just, I mean, for a centre-back, that's one of the most majestic performances I think I've ever seen. And anyone who gets the ball off Bernardo Silva must literally rip his boots off and take the Velcro off of it because it's just stuck to him. They are an incredible football team. Yes, they are. But you mentioned De Bruyne today. You look at the results with and without De Bruyne. There is no question he, in terms of winning games for them, he's the most important player they've got. Yes, Haaland, like you say, is a physical freak. And that creates its own problems with the way we are now setting up to play with the incredibly high line, because that's based on the fact that actually our back three, as it is right now, and they are the best three centre-backs we have to play that back three, well, Emilio showed probably in for Burke in a league game, but all four of them are physical presences who can run with most attackers in this league. It's why he does what, why we are playing this high line that we are. Problem we have is that is the first time we've fa- faced a centre forward who is both quick enough to trouble our recovery pace and, as you mentioned, is the size of man to bully Tanya Mengi. And what he does, a lot of centre-halves do it. Morris tries to do it the other end, and as you mentioned, he got pinged for it. The the ones that want to play as a target man or, or have that physical presence to, they want to get into the centre-half, lock on, quite often by having a hand on a shirt of the centre-half, in order to be able to roll them. Now, Harlan's the first guy that's able to do that and bully Mengi from there. Mengi, when he's stuck in that position, I noticed that a lot of times in the first half, whereas most center halves will look for the space, he will look for the contact of Mengi to get in there to create that position. Now, having got time, particularly when he gets his hand on his shirt like that, when he when the ball's played from De Bruyne and it's going to be well cast, he then is able to roll him, which gives Mengi in a huge problem when you're manning up like that. Because... You've got the option of fouling him, outright plain fouling him, which is a booking because he's going to be through on goal at that point. Going down and playing on the short pull, which is a foul but never gets given, except if you cut Morris at the other end, hmm. which hmm. that happens. And often, that or you pull with him and you both go down. And every time he tried that, Harlan got the free kick. So it was a, it made it very, very difficult. And it is impossible, I think, to man up Erling Haaland because he's a beast of a human being. You are absolutely right when you say he looks like he's playing an adult sport at boys' level. Mm. I mean, a beast. You can't tell. I mean, I've seen loads of Manchester City on television. You just can't tell on TV how physical he is, how how much of a threat he is. And I mean, we're not going to go through all the goals, James, because we'll be here forever. But <laughs> I mean, goals two and three are exactly the same, aren't they? De Bruyne gets the ball in space. He lights up, off he goes. The the pace of pass is absolutely perfect. Poor old Ted, and he does his best to keep up with him. Even when he gets back to him, he's just swatted off like he's a fly. And then the finish is, oh, okay, the second one, I mean, Tim Crawl's going to look at himself in the mirror and think I could have done better there. Third one's just taking a piss. And, you know, 
And then, uh, to be fair to Tim Krull, and he's got a lot of flack on social media, and I can understand why, because goals two, five, and six, he'll look at, he won't need me to tell him that he could have done better with those. He'll look at that and he'll know that. But at the same time, that could have been 12 to 15, but for Tim Krull. He's made made a brilliant double save in the first half. He's made a save from Haaland in the second half when John Stones has put him through with yet another perfectly precise pass. So he's had a tough night at the office, but at the same time, he's had a good night at the office. But Haaland's finishing is just, I mean, we mentioned it against Liverpool. They don't just find the middle of the goal. They find the bits of the goal where you can't get to. Well, this guy, he doesn't need to find the bits of the goal that you can't get to because he just wellies it straight through anything. And it's just, it's, you, can, you can only put your hands up and say, look, that's impressive to watch. And they're at a level, not just Luton aren't near, no other team other than Liverpool possibly in world football and near right now. Yeah, I'd agree. I mean, he, on his shooting, he's just, he managed to find holes in goalkeepers, which is incredible, or blast them through goalkeepers. I mean, Krull must have had the best worst performance of all time mm-hmm. because some incredible saves, especially when he had already scored two and there was a double save of him and De Bruyne. Um, but then, yeah, the, the, the howlers, particularly... Um, that that fifth one, I mean, even the sixth one. When you look at it, I mean, they they called it. They said it was dipping on commentary that I've seen since, and it's not. It's very close to him, and he'd, he'd be disappointed with that one. But you know, you can't dig him out too much because, like you say, it probably Harlan probably could have had five in the first half if it weren't for him, and he probably could have had seven, and then Man City probably could have double had double figures, and then um, then you're in a, a world of pain after that because at the minute. Six two, we have not experienced that for a very long time, but it, it, does, it doesn't even feel disappointing uh, or, too, or too disappointing, or too gutting because they are that good. It just feels like it's just a freak game that, unfortunately, we have to play again. But their place we might might be even worse. But I don't, I don't see what you can do to stop them other than just literally park the bus. And to be fair, Luton had a go and it's earned a bit, earned a few plaudits for that, but. You can't go toe to toe with them, and even if you did park the bus, you probably can't. You can't do it that way. So, I don't know how you how you, how, you, how you solve that mystery and riddle. Well, here's the thing, isn't it? You park the bus, you're just waiting to be beaten, basically. So, you, Rob Edwards went with a sort of tactic of kill before we get killed, and as it turned out, we got killed before we could kill, and that's that's fair enough. Um, I've seen a lot of people saying that it was kamikaze to put Ted Mengi up against Hurl and Harland one-on-one. Okay, so what's the alternative to that? Well, we bring another person in to help Ted Mengi, and that's going to leave someone free. This lot of 11 footballing freaks. I mean, even the bloody goalkeepers pinging 60-yard passes. Not to Harland for him to chase after. As Steve mentioned earlier, they're to his feet. They're not even to his chest. They're not to his head or anything like that. They're to his feet. So he can either spin Ted and Mengi or he controls it. And then Harland, uh, sorry, uh, De Bruyne runs on. And either way, we're in a world of trouble. But the one thing about this team, Steve, whatever the situation, they never, ever give up. And we're three nil down to the best side in the world. And a lot of teams, and I'm looking at you, Sheffield United, would have capsized. But we don't. We get back in the game. We still try. We give it our all. And to be fair, let's, Let's make it right. Between 1-0 and 2-0, Luton were probably on top in the game. He had a few good crosses from Alfie Doughty that we just couldn't quite get in front of a defender to convert. Uh, Corley Woodrow uh, curled a shot just wide as well. So it, it wasn't all complete and utter domination, but their ruthlessness was different class. However, the one thing we can take away from the night is the goal of the night. Jordan Clark, just on the stroke of half time, Barkley flicks the ball up, lays it back to Clark. 25, 30 yards out or whatever it was. And he sends a gorgeous curler into the top corner that even Manchester City's goalkeeper's waving goodbye to. I don't know if it will be goal of the season, but it's definitely a cracking strike. I'm going to be a bit contrarian here. I don't think he's group in town's best goal of the game. Technically, I for the, the pass by Barkley and the quality of Clark's finish, I think the second goal is better. A guy getting the ball in space, a creative midfielder, let's be honest, that's what clicker is. Yes, it's a fantastic goal, and it and seeing it back, it's even better when you see just how close to the corner of the goal, the postage step, I suppose the kids call it. It is. It is a fantastic goal, and one of the best long-range shots you're going to see. But the 
the quality of the pass from Ross Barkley was actually as good as anything we actually saw. We talked about the Bruyne. We got anything we've seen with the Bruyne. Obviously, we had a lot less chance to do that, but we talked about the line we play. That is the reason he does it. I don't think he trusts the defenders we've got left to play a low block and keep a huge amount of clean sheets. He trusts them that their recovery pace is going to work, and by playing the high line, we're going to get Barkley, Lukonga when he's fit, Clicker, and our forward players in areas to hurt them. Now, if you play a low block, Barkley is in not, not in that position to create both goals in the way that he did. Clicker's not in the position as the other central midfielder to score both goals in the way that he did. Whether it's the right thing to do, that is a different question. But you saw both sides of it last night. And it's a question we'll come on to in a moment because Rob made a comment in his post-match press conference, which we'll play shortly, and um, we will discuss exactly that. The one thing that I will say right now is do not judge any tactics of or any potential survival chances or anything like that on anything we saw last night because this lot are just a freak show. And when you run into them at their very best, they just they destroy sides much big, much bigger, much better than Luton in much more ruthless fashion than that. And these other teams don't even get a sniff. We actually had a sniff at three two, and I actually agree with Steve James. I thought that second goal was beautiful. The pass, if the pass was made by Kevin De Bruyne, we'd be seeing it in two years' time. It's that good. Just to have the vision of it, it's that good. I mean, <laughs> to be fair, he's absolutely mullered his shot from the goalkeeper's clearance, hasn't he? Straight into the defender and it's luckily it's bounced back to him. But then the flick over, the chest control, knowing where the goal is, walloping it in the top corner. It was a great moment. But then when you sat down again, you're like, oh, fuck, we've just poked the bear here and it's, we're in trouble again. Yeah, it was, it was nothing short of gorgeous, really, wasn't it? It was a wonderful uh, piece of skill to, to get the ball over over the top and then Clicker's finish was was unerring. It, it was a really great goal. And yeah, the, the, that would be talked about a hell of a lot more um, if, if the result was not so heavy, really. Um, but at that stage, Luton were playing well, the period just before half-time, the period just after I'm playing really well. Uh, but I mean, they already had a three goal head start so it's like even if it was a traditional team where you're going after a um, a three goal lead and you're trying to be progressive you're going to leave spaces aren't you and then uh, in the way that they play and in picking picking you off it was um, it was ball after ball and it, I know De Bruyne had played most of them and he got those four assists but all of their midfield and even some of the defence were able to pick them Um because one of the goals in the second half was a massive long through ball. Um, Walker. Yeah, from, from inside their own half. And you, you just don't see that Luton don't concede those against other teams. And they were just doing it like it was nothing. And it, it, you, sometimes you just got to hold your hands up and say, they are incredible. And, um, you know, they're probably depleted uh, when they came down last time in the, in the Premier League. Um, and Luton obviously had a camber and stuff so there's a bit more protection and, and Lox was Lox was there as well so it's different um, you just hope that it doesn't sort of get in their heads too much hopefully not and we'll come on to that uh, in a moment as well yeah the mad thing was I thought we were probably 10 times better last night than we were in that league game the statistics will definitely show that to you we had hell of a lot more possession last night than we did in the league game 14 shots at goal compared to 4 in the league game 7 shots on target compared to 2 in the league game and yet we get done six in the cup game. It's just one, well, two men in particular who weren't there at the league game, who were there last night, who proper fancied the job. And we um, we ultimately paid the price. Goals four, five and six. Well, four and five, certainly. Very similar. The ball from Walker through to De Bruyne for the build up to that second one outside of the right boot. I mean, come on now, give us a chance. Mm -hmm. And then De Bruyne's cross, Haaland, simple simple goal. The fifth one we've spoken about, Cruel will want to do better. And the sixth one from Kovacic, it was nice to see someone else score, actually, because <laughs> I was getting a bit bored of Haaland scoring. I've got to be honest with you. I was screaming at Pep, come on, son, he's had his fun. Get rid. Get, and finally, I think, uh, I think he listened. I think Nice is doing a lot of heavy lifting in that sentence. <laughs> it is. It is. But, you know, 
Kovacic scored anyway. Not probably their worst footballer at, actually out of in terms of actual <laughs> talent and technique. Uh, yet he still scored from twenty yards. So that kind of summed it all up. Difficult night at the office though, Steve. But not one that we need to dwell on too much. We watched a football in masterclass, but we've now got thirteen games to su- save our season. Yes, we do. And as far as Rob Edwards is concerned, as he said many times. W- there's another team closer to us because I'm sure his 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 table on the on the wall in the brace will actually have Everton six six points closer to us rather than four points further away. <laughs> but yeah, there is going to be a and you look at those thirteen games. I think barring so you can't plan for us to take many points away from home. You've got Arsenal away. You've got Tottenham away. We've talked about having Man City away. So you're down to 10 games already, realistically. Uh, and ironically, the rest of those away games are huge because we got Paris. Paris, for me, is the big one. Until they got that win against Burnley, I still thought that Paris might be the team that we should be looking at if you're ignoring points deductions. And then a lot of the home games are obviously ones we've got, well, other than Saturday against Villa, but they are huge games. Uh, Brentford to come here Fulham who and Wolves both Fulham at home and Wolves away both games who they're so late in the season maybe maybe they're on the beach Uh, see the Heverton home game like I say it's huge and my biggest worry is the fact that so many of our home games now are against teams who are in or around us who will probably now be more than happy to take a point away from Kenilworth Road and made learn some lessons from Sheffield United. Yeah, they did set the um, blueprint, Sheffield United. Um, but, you know, we learn with everyone, don't we? And Rob's very keen that we'll learn from from this match, and I'm sure we will, and I agree with Steve. Those three away games, just keep the goal difference down. I think that's the realistic top aim. And then concentrate on the other 10 in the hope that we get... 15, 16 points or whatever it is that we need to stay up. Let's hear a little bit from Rob because he gave a press conference after the game, which we sent James along to, where he said a few interesting things. The first one being, do not expect Luton to change between now and the end of the season. Here's exactly what he said. I think there's always things that we can do and we can do better. You know, and I look at it back and go, right, what's what can I take from it? Yeah, can I learn where can to help us improve there's no doubt about it they were they were incredible um and they you know they played to the space that we that we gave them and did it very very well um but look I, our lads were incredibly brave and bold and and stuck to the task and stuck to what I'm asking them to do and that we're committing to doing and sometimes when you're quite brave and bold then you come up against that kind of team you can come unstuck and we we did tonight and um but look, we're not going to change. We just got to get better and keep improving. Um, and we're not going to come up against that, thankfully, every week. And um, yeah, it is disappointing to go out. We didn't want to go out. You know, we gave it everything and we didn't want to. We wanted to try and win the game. Came uh, came up against a, a a much better team in the end and um, and they deservedly went through, obviously. But uh, no, we have to dust ourselves down, learn quickly, bounce in again into, into training and, and, and look to try and attack the game on Saturday because you're right, it is a, a huge game for us now. I mean, we've done this on a number of occasions this year. We've come back and, you know, from a few goals down, we don't we don't ever give up. And it was unfortunate tonight we couldn't get the last goal in the game. We talk a lot about that. Let's get the last goal. Get, you know, always keep pushing, trying to give the fans something to sing about and be proud of. And at 3-2, you know, we gave ourselves a chance. The, f- the fourth goal was disappointing and how we, you know, they're all disappointing. Slip from click of the first goal and, you know, you one nil down after a couple of minutes when we talked about having such a good start, trying to get such a good start in the game. The fourth was frustrating. Um, and we could have been better in that moment, no, no doubt about it. But again, that's it's on me. I'm asking the lads to be uh, to play this way, and, and at times against amazing movement and, and brilliant world class play and the timing of the pass and detail of where it goes. And it, you know, we we came unstuck a little bit. Four two, it's almost game over. Then when we've given ourselves a bit of a, a glimmer, but this group have shown that time after time. And you know, we'll, we'll ne- we we can't ever give up. And um, if you do against a team like that, then you know they're ruthless and they keep going. And and they were they were tonight. Um so 
yeah, a tough night, a tough night for us. But but it's not going to diminish our confidence or our belief in what we're trying to achieve and what we're trying to do. We've got to try and see this game and and, partic- and Wednesday in particular, these two games as opportunities for us to learn. Come on, we're this that's the level, that's elite, that's the best that we've come up against. How can this make us better? And, we're, and, and again, we're not going to come up against them every single week. I know we're coming up against a really good team in Aston Villa on Saturday, um, who I went to watch on the weekend and we're, they were brilliant, you know, so it doesn't get much easier. But um, we try and take some of the positive going forward. That's a fair assessment of the situation, James. But the line in that that was key for me that I want to touch on, we're not going to change. Now, is that right? I think it's... I know I, I can understand people that want to be a bit more pragmatic in certain situations, but I think um, Steve outlined it quite well about um, the the defence. And we'd heard a couple of weeks ago about this risk and reward. It's ever since um, the bright, the Brentford game. And after that, when they reassessed and ever since then, they've, they've been playing more to this, which is, I think you're just going to have to accept against really good teams, you might take a beating. But were you were we expecting to beat Arsenal, Liverpool, Tottenham, and all those? T- I, I don't think we've beaten anyone in the top six so far. So, you know, I, I can understand. I don't think goal goal difference is going to come into it or anything like that at, at the minute as things stand. So, um, this uh. It, it's a good way of playing attacking wise, but you're just going to have to <laughs> accept there might be a few goals going in the other end. But um, it, it's a difficult one to really judge at this stage because you're off the back of three Premier League defeats on the spin and a paste in against, um, against Man City. But um, I think everybody, you know, until those results came along and obviously everyone was disappointed by the Sheffield United one, but Everybody's really excited about about that style of football, uh, and they, they were getting on board. And they certainly Luton are taking it to other teams more than Sheffield United and and, and Burnley are. Um, so I think, it, given the uh, attacking options that Luton have, or well, at the moment, a bit diminished because of injuries, but I think you've got to play to that strength and. Um, I've just sort of, after that, I've just sort of steeled myself for going to the Emirates and going to uh, Tottenham's new stadium and just thinking, well, we hope for a win, but perhaps not. But all the more important games are the ones from the teams in and around. Which they are, Steve, yeah. Um, That's for sure. I mean, you highlighted it perfectly earlier on. If we're going to stay in this league, we're going to stay in this league because we're scoring goals. Because without Tom, and obviously we're not going to have Tom now, not just Tom's defensive skills, but his organisation of those back three. Um, without him, we're left with, if we if we go with the back three that you said, Bell, Osho and Mengi, we're left with a 28-year-old who's largely a left back who's still converting to centre-back in Bell. 24-year-old, I think, Gabe Osho is, who's at this level for the first time, and a 21-year-old in Ted and Mengi. Their organisational leadership skills aren't where Tom's are. So we're going to concede goals. That's sort of a given. So we're going to have to score goals if we're going to stay up. So I I liked what Rob said, that we're not going to change. The one thing we do need to change, though, is giving ourselves a chance in games. We've been 2-0 down in the last two games at Kenilworth Road, of our own doing, largely. OK, Click has slipped on the edge of the box for Man City's first one. That happens. That's fine. Amari Bell's mistake, and, he, and it's an innocent mistake, but he puts Rasmus Hoyland clean through on goal after 30-odd seconds. Sheffield United should have led after 30-odd seconds. And even Newcastle were ahead after five minutes when we went there. We need to get to that sort of 10, 15-minute mark where we're still in a game because we build into a game with this style absolutely perfectly, but we're out of a game after 10 or 15 minutes. That's what I'd like to see us change, not the approach that we go about it. Just in those first 10 or 15 minutes, appreciate where we are in the game and just make sure we do everything that we can to get through. I mean, obviously, we hope we start like we did against Brighton, but get through like we did against Liverpool, get through that first 10 minutes and then sort of go on the front for ourselves. That's what I that's what I think we need to change. I, I get that point, but I don't think that's going to happen. At the end of the day, as I mentioned earlier, 
he looks at those three players particularly, and and also the fact that Marvelous isn't going to be back, we hear, possibly till the end of the season. I don't think he believes that we can, at this level, ha- have any kind of low block or organised zonal marking scheme with the defensive unit we've got left of the players we've got available. Maybe if Mads came back, that'd be different because obviously Tom isn't going to come back this year, certainly, if at all. And I say, we haven't got him at defensive midfielder. That's an entirely different conversation, but all clubs struggled in January to look at players if you take the Luton Town spectacles off. Uh, All our central midfielders are in the main forward-thinking players, so you want them in the other half. But you said about trying to build in well, the fact is, the entire point is he wants to get those defenders man up because he believes nine times out of ten, more, more times than not, the risk reward's going to work in our favour more more than trying to be organised and play a low block without some of the players we are missing. And all of those mistakes, yes, they're bad individual errors, but they are exacerbated because of the style of play. So I don't think trying to say, there's a, you've got to build a little more. Yes, there are still elements, particularly in the Sheffield United game, where maybe put a foot through it a little bit more when you do win a ball back in earlier moments in the game or in key moments in the game. I think that's the one thing we can change, but that's not necessarily at the start. That's at points in the game where that happens. But I think he sees that that is kind of... The, and it's not like he's never played that this season before those games. I think he'd changed based on what he felt the game did. I think the Arsenal Man City double header well, I can't remember the word double header. They felt like double headers at the time. Uh, <laughs> when we played them two in the league games at home, we did very well and were unlucky in both those games. Now the art the City game is that more structured, more low block, more controlled style. And he he almost intimated after the Arsenal game that that would be the case. He felt Arsenal would struggle more against the more chaos theory, as he called it at the time, that playing the high line and the man-to-man marking and being really aggressive suggested. That's the thing that's clicked in his head, that I think, with the play, that that's a possibility. And now I think it's just he doesn't see he has the squad left available to play any other way and be successful. This season, so that's, and that's fair enough. Because considering the injuries, isn't it? I think that's yeah, some some really really key players. Really, a, a couple of weeks ago, we were looking at only Mads and Nakamba out um, at Locks as well. But we, I think everybody had um, assumed that Locks would not be back at least this season, if at all. Like like Steve says, but then the injury list just growing, and now it's Bell's been added to it as well. So it's um, yeah, it's looking a bit threadbare at the moment. It is, yep. I think the general consensus, certainly with Rob's comments there, are concerned. Kevin Keegan style. (laughs) That's the way it's going to be from now on. They score three, we'll try and score four and hope that we do that more times than we don't. The main thing is take those three games away from it. We've got 10 games against teams who do not have attacking talent like Arsenal, like Tottenham like Manchester City and like Liverpool previous to that. They're the games where this style will born out results uh, and they've got to. If they don't, then it's on us, but it's in our hands to go out in those games with this style to win them and get the points that we need. As I say, 15, 16 points, however many it ends up having to be in those 10 games. And if we do sneak a point somewhere along the line in one of those away games, if we catch someone like a Newcastle in a 4-4 or something, then happy days. And um, that's how it is, really. Positives. Lots of people told me there were none last night. The full-time whistle was definitely one, and it came along very, very quickly as well. None of this seven or eight minutes injury time that there should have been. Uh, Obviously, Anthony Taylor realised the M6 was going to be naffed up and uh, wanted out of there pretty quickly, which is fair enough. Uh, But one real positive, and we saw it previously in this competition, was Joe Johnson, who was thrown into the mix, not by choice, I think Rob admitted that he was going to bring Gabe Osho on for Amari Bell, who picked up what looked to be some sort of groiny, issuey thing. No one actually confirmed it, but hopefully it's not too bad. 
Uh, Osho was kind of feeling something as well in the warm up, so they didn't risk him. They threw Joe Johnson in there, one of our own. He initially started at left centre half in place of Omari Bell. Then when we went in at half time, that changed and it was Alfred Doughty that went left centre half and Joe Johnson went left full back, sorry, left wing back. You wouldn't believe he's only had two or three first team appearances though, would you? Or that he was up against the world champions because he just looked like he took to it perfectly. He was kind of having the time of his life, really. I mean, you put you put him up against Carl Walker, England's right back. Didn't really look massively out of place. Uh, to be f- I mean, obviously Erlen Haaland bullied him for the third goal. That's fine. This is Erlen Haaland. That's completely understandable. He's not a centre-back. He's a wing-back and that's all fine. But I thought he settled into the game well and I thought he looked really, really, really good. Yeah, it was some baptism of fire, that wasn't it. His first action was pretty much to watch Ra- Erling Haaland race away from him. But I mean, he wasn't the only defender that had the, that view of, of that particular player. But yeah, I mean, it's promising. And it, the, these are the situations where young players will get a chance. Um, you're either so good you can't be left out or really promising and then um, injuries or availability in the squad allows you to have that chance and then um, you, and you get in. If you just look back to the other JJ, he was not the first, first choice um, left back in that season, in that league um in that league one season, it was Dan Potts and then Dan Potts goes and get injured and, and JJ has a stormer and look at him now. So, um, yeah, I'm not saying, I'm not going to put any more pressure on Joe Johnson uh, to, to be doing that. He's playing at a high level for a start, but um, it just shows you what can be done. And, you know, he, he trains with the first team now. He could, he could, he should probably be playing for the under 18s given his age, but if he's good enough to be, training with the first team squad, then um, he's only going to benefit from from games and minutes. And, and like Rob said, hopefully the whole squad can benefit from that experience of last night and take some positive out of it, of, of understanding um, Manchester City and Liverpool as well, of what real elite looks like. Because, you know, the, it was like a hurricane again, the second half against Anfield and, uh, and throughout pretty much the whole game against Man City so it's a, it's about learning and hopefully he does yeah let's hear Rob, Rob said uh, Rob had to say uh, about Joe Johnson in particular uh, it was brought up in his post-match press conference he, he wasn't fully fit going into the game but obviously Gabe wasn't either and then when I was going to bring Gabe on Gabe was sort of saying I was feeling it in the warm-up as well so Gabe didn't come on so that uh, was young JJ uh, all the best mate get on there against this lot and um, I thought I thought he was brilliant you know, for a young 80, just turned 18 year old lad to come into that. I, I was so proud of him. It was brilliant. So yeah, we, we've we got a few, we've got some more wounds at the moment and um, we hopefully, we'll have to do a lot of work now to try and be as strong as we can for the weekend. But no excuses. It's just, that's just what it is at the moment. Um, but yeah, it became difficult then. We've all kind of ended up the game against them with sort of two defenders on the pitch. <laughs> that's tough then. <laughs> We, he's hard to read, young Joe. He's, he's he's just straight and serious, and yeah, go on, no problem. I don't think much phases him, like it didn't at Goodison Park in the last round against Everton. So um, he's got a he's got a really good future, as, as you know. You you've seen him, more of him than most, and you you'll back that up. Um, he's got a really good mentality, and I thought again, I thought another one, really brave, really brave young player, and um, took responsibility tonight, and and showed some really good things. It's amazing. We got we got a great academy. We've got brilliant people working here. I've said this before to you as well, and um, that we got some good young players that are going to get opportunities to play. He's one. Zach's another one that's been involved as well a lot, and uh, his time will come. Yeah, that was Amari Bell that Rob was alluding to right at the start of um, that little piece. Uh, Steve, what did you make of Joe Johnson? And and I guess one of the reasons why Ryan Giles was allowed to go was because they have full trust in Joe Johnson if if and when needed. He's not going to have a harder game than that last night, is he? Well, I'd have to agree with that. I, I agree your point. There's, there's no question. When he, Considering Giles went so late in the window, we must have been aware that there would be at least a reasonable chance that well, there are other irons in the fire, and I presume there were, given the fact we've ended up with a 24-man squad. They surely would have kept Giles if they would have felt that more important than taking the risk to try and bring whoever they obviously were unable to in. And 
the only reason to do that would be they have at least some element of trust in Joe Johnson. I think Rob Edwards did quite well, like you mentioned earlier, to make that switch at halftime when he had the time to do it in an organised way. It might not necessarily have been the best thing for us to try and get back in the game, albeit that we almost immediately did get that second goal. Uh, I think it was the best thing possibly for Joe Johnson's development. I don't think anyone at England under, well, England youth level where he has been playing and has played in the World Cup already, or anyone at our football cover really sees him as a centre-back. He is a wing-back, so allowing him to play there does, for his development, probably work out better than forcing a play centre half for left centre half for the second half against the quality players you mentioned. There, there's unquestionably talent there. I think we saw it, and he was m- m- very comfortable in the Everton game from the bits I saw in the highlights. So there's certainly something there. I don't, I don't think we can get carried away. I think you've got to remember how quickly we've risen through the leagues and the struggles that the elite player performance pathway puts on any club with a limited budget to be able to keep their academy at the level of the first team when that happens. Obviously, the discussions about an elite player performance pathway and how that works is a discussion for another time, but it makes it very difficult for our football club to be able to have players that would be in our, in our academy that would be anywhere near ready to be anywhere near the higher end championship level or even the bottom end championship level let alone the Premier League level because they would normally get pinched by a bigger academy that could invest more into it because they are a, have a big, bigger budget but there is something there with JJ I don't want to get overexcited but you got, he looks like someone who should be able to have at least a career in the game yeah he does put a lovely cross in in the second half that Andros Townsend could have maybe done better with and then he was offside only for Anthony Taylor to play about 15 minutes of an advantage before bringing the ball back for uh, offside which was yet another piece of nonsense refereeing in a large game of nonsense refereeing <laughs> another positive and then we didn't have to search too far for this one the one new signing we did make that's ready for the first team in January Daiki Hashioka came on with about 25 minutes to go. Uh, He was obviously given a man-marking job on Jeremy Doku because he went everywhere with him. And in fact, I think when Doku went on the team bus, he looked to his left and there was Hashioka (laughs) (laughs) ready to um, go with him as well. He he marked him perfectly, but he got forward as well. Rob's earmarked him as a... as a fullback stroke wing back who's going to get forward and he's going to contribute heavily to the attacking sort of parts of the pitch. And he did do that. And generally as a, as a first 25 minutes in a game that was as tough as it was, there was a lot to like about him. Yeah, I think so. I mean, he's everything I thought that we'd, we'd be getting and not that I knew anything about him beforehand, but um, in the position that Luton wanted him to play, there's this, you, you've got to be a certain type of player and, Rob's talked about his aggressiveness in defence, but I think he was very positive going forward as well. Um, you know, it, it was ultimately fruitless against Man City, but you know, play, uh, teams further down the division, then then who knows? And I think it was, you know, we earmarked it that we thought that would be his debut um, in some capacity. I think it would have been a stretch maybe to start him from the beginning, but to give him nearly half an hour. I think ultimately in the long run is going to be um, very positive and well, he's probably going to get thrust into it a lot sooner than, than not because the the defensive injury list is just um, growing, uh, particularly after after Bell. Um, so it's going to be a, quite a reshuffle really at the back. I don't expect he'll be ready for Villa um, after that unless he recovers in some sort of miracle fashion. So um, yeah, it, it's only going to stand him in, in good stead, but he's going to have to learn quick, isn't he? Yeah, he is. Here's what the boss had to say about his new recruit. Yeah, yeah, real positive for us. That was there was a I knew there was a silver line in there. It, yeah, um, and I thought he did really well. Hashi we had a few weeks obviously getting him right. Felt his hamstring quite early on, and he's a little bit tight. And um, obviously, within the way we play, we needed some getting up to speed quite quickly. So really pleased with the um, with getting him a good run out, and uh, that's a big positive for us. Yeah. What did you make of our Japanese international, Steve? He looked lively. He he said that he certainly had a decent amount of pace to him. I think 
I don't think he realised quite how quick Derek Jeremy Doku was when the first time he tried to take him on down the right-hand side. <laughs> I was like, no, you may be quick, mate, but yeah, Doku's pretty quick, quick himself. It, there's certainly something there. We've, we've seen from little bits of that in that half an hour. I think there's an element of being careful with, with him. We, we don't have a history very often of signing players directly from abroad. The foreign players we do have, you look recently, even the two we've signed in in the summer, K- Kaminsky and Anderson, they've been in the UK for a considerable amount of time. We don't have a huge play liaison net. I, could, I don't imagine we have a huge play liaison network to bed new signings in. And I think that's all, what, particularly when it comes to foreign signings. And the last one we had was Sluga, and obviously COVID obviously didn't help with, potentially with how he coped with being in England. But, the big clubs, when they sign these players, have huge play liaison units to bed players into new con- country, new sc- things like schools for their kids or housing. I remember a story of a Wolves player, I think it's Sulky Hyen, who was delighted to sign for Fulham, mainly because he'd been doing all this shopping in New Malden, because that's where the, <laughs> Kore- the, the, the Korean community is in London, which is quite a trek for your groceries from yeah. Wolverhampton. <laughs> so, certainly... He's got to have to... Obviously, he's had to do that before by moving to Belgium. And I was actually pretty... So, it'll be interesting to see how long we take to bed him in. But we've got to understand that he's having to deal with living in a new country. And that's probably a good big reason, the reason we've been so slow to bed him in. Yep, I would agree with that. Definitely signs of life in that one. So, there's some positives anyway. And, of course, Clark was just... Lovely, just a lovely footballer, uh, obviously 10 years on from when he was playing in Manchester for Hyde United. So what a story that is. Um, And his first goal since that one at Wembley. Which weren't bad and weren't that unimportant either, was it really? (laughs) So certainly more important than the two he scored last night, ultimately. Um, It is a damaging defeat, though. Anytime you concede six, you know, these are human beings we're talking about. So it is damaging. Um, before I get your opinions on just how damaging it might be, let's hear from Rob again, because this was brought up in his press conference and I think it's pertinent. So here's what Rob had to say about the potential damage of this defeat. I hope it doesn't have an effect or a negative effect. Hopefully, like I said, the, the stuff that I'm talking about, I'm always going to come out and try and back the team and try and be bullish and say what I think are the right things. But then time will tell now and how we react. And um, I, knowing this group the way I do, I think they'll react in the right way. We've got some really good leaders there. We've got lads that 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 know how big the games are coming up. And tonight, you know, we've got we've been hit by a, an amazing team. I could be the best team in the world, one of the best teams I've probably ever seen. Um, there's no shame in that. But there'll be bits that we I know, and it'll be it's on me the areas that we can improve and work on, um, and we'll work really hard to try and rectify that quickly. But uh, I don't see it knocking this group. You know, we've got to make sure we use it to get better and not to, you know, allow us to feel sorry for ourselves or, you know, because if you do that in this league, then you are done. And we're not done at the moment. We're not, you know, we're we're in with that fighting chance that we've talked about. So, um, yeah, let's learn and make sure we get better rather than feel sorry for ourselves. Yeah, I think there will be an understanding. There's got to be a, a, a reality there as well that we come up against yeah, arguably the best nine and ten combination I've I've seen. Certainly, I've seen live. Anyway, you know, I know there's people like Lionel Messi might have a little bit of a, something to say on that. But actually, the combination of Bernard Haaland, De Bruyne tonight was pretty sensational, and the supporting cast around them wasn't bad either. So, um, yeah, I, I don't. Again, I, I think there's some real reality in the in our room there that we've come up against brilliant, brilliant players. We've given it everything. You know, it was an entertaining game. And that's important, but it's also important that we we get better, and um, and I think we'll do that. The lads will respond well. Yeah, these are professional footballers, James. So um, they're going to look at what they came up against last night, and they're going to look at it, and they're going to be like, "Well, that's the levels that we need to try and get to." They're not going to get there overnight, of course. They're not. The golf is big, but I think back to two thousand and five. Whenever we come up against teams of this ilk. And before the season started in 2005, we played Ajax in a friendly. And that was peak Ajax. Ibrahimovic, Seydorf, 
everyone who was good of Ajax football was was there that night and we got absolutely battered. Touched the ball twice if we were lucky. <laughs> they were absolute different class, Ibrahimovic in particular. But then we went and won the first 10 games that season and we ultimately went and won the league as we all know. When you come up against good footballers, it makes you appreciate what good football is and you elevate your standards to the next level. And that's the test for us now. It is. And I think back to the last time they got truly battered was probably that Brentford one, the 7-0. Awful, in, yeah. In, um, well, yeah, that as well. And you bounce back with um, certainly a win in against Wigan after that Brentford one in the And in Reading the after the Wigan one, yep. Uh, after the Fulham one, sorry. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, you know, there's, there's there's hope there. And this is why I don't really feel too annoyed by the result it's it's quite a heavy one and but but that, they can do that to anybody but the reason i don't feel quite so annoyed is that they've learned so much this season already and and put it into practice and developed so quick you don't get jürgen klopp um praising you to the hilt for the job you've done um in in such a short space of time of of changing things up and and they have they were a lot very timid and and shell shocked almost in the first couple of games and they've developed and they're now playing this style to the point we're debating it on this podcast about whether this um risk and reward and um not changing the, the style is, is going to be worth it um ultimately we won't know but i'd almost rather luton did that and had a bloody good go at this and you know trying to trying to score their way out of trouble than trying to nick things because it's just it just feels tense and you get you'll get the crowd largely with you if you do that and try and play progressive attacking football so um you know i'm quite comfortable with that it's just whether how much it gets in their heads this this result because you know if you watched i watched the highlights after i got back from Kenneth road and at one stage what i can't remember which goal it was because he scored so many but just mengi just had a look of shock on his face because He's not had to deal with that at all. He's been such a revelation in in this um, in his Hatters career so far, and then he just comes up against this guy. I thought I I thought that Mengi was as strong as an ox, but it turns out that Harland is strong as ten of them. So he just looked like what what the hell do I do against this guy? Because nothing works, and he might be, he's not the only one in, in in world football. Everybody probably thinks that, but um, it, it's. It's human nature to, to to wonder, you know, how it will affect them, and it may be human nature as well for them guys to to sort of like take 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 a little bit of a hit. But ultimately, I think that they have bounced back so well from from adversity this season that I think uh, it's going to be a very tough game against Aston Villa. But um, I don't think that it will get it will get to them too much. Yeah, where are you with this, Steve? Are you worried about the effect that it might have or are you on the side of there'll be a reality within the dressing room and they'll just move on from it? I think it will generally depend player on player and and, and part of Rob's job. As much as he can change things, and we've already mentioned the various areas, he basically can't because it's filled everybody that's fair. Uh, He's got to see how people react to that. Ironically, the ones that might ha- have the most shell shock developments would be at centre half, and at the minute we've got everyone we've got fit playing at centre half because the drop off behind that to the under 18s is huge because they're not flush with centre half for the level they're at, let alone trying to play any of them in a Premier League game. So that's the danger, but we just got to hope though that. that the defenders we've got playing do take, are able to cope with it and come out of it with a positive mindset reaction to it. And if there are players further up the field where we do have a few more options that he can, that Rob can see have possibly taken that harder and are reacting to it in a less preferable way, obviously they're the ones that you've got to look at and maybe take them out the fire for a bit. Yeah, this is where the sort of idea of signing Ross Barkley and Andros Townsend as much for their input off the pitch as on it stands to good reason, really. Um, 
they've been through it before. Certainly Andros Townsend, he's used to relegation scraps. He knows what this is all about. He's been at Everton and Crystal Palace throughout most of his career. And also us as supporters, you know, if we see anyone's head dipping on Saturday, just sing, be louder, make sure that the, the boys know that we're right behind them as we always are. And hopefully we put that um, game last night to bed. It's not going to determine whether we stay up or whether we don't stay up. All it's going to determine is whether uh, Man City win the treble or not. And they're a step closer to that. And I think they will based on last night's evidence. That's almost it for this time, this uh, episode of the podcast. But before we finish, Steve, the Disabled Supporters Association, hugely important um branch of the supporters club uh just talk to us a little bit about that and you've got an agm coming up yeah well it's a separate organization it's in while we use the club's facilities we are independent of the football club uh like a lot of organizations particularly ones that are only four or five years old as we were uh covid hit us intensely hard it stopped a lot of the things that we had been planning to do but we played but up until that point we'd done a lot of work, Hatter's Vision, the audio description service w- that is available at Kenilworth Road has got a massive upgrade thanks to some of the work of people at the club in conjunction with ourselves. And obviously we're out of COVID now and the next 12, 24 months we hope are going to be very big for the Disabled Supporters Association. Like I say, we have the AGM coming up. Anyone that is a disabled supporter is eligible to become a member. In fact, if you are eligible to get disabled tickets, you are automatically on our database. So you are automatically a member of the association. There's no membership fees. And we're not just open to disabled supporters. We are open to anyone who has a family member, who's a gluten family, disabilities anyone that wants to be part of the association and wants to help and like you say we have the agm that's next wednesday at the john moore we've got some links I, I, there's an event bike link that's so long we'll hopefully have it on the youtube i'll send it so, so you'll be able to see it there yeah we'll have and, it in the we'll have it in the show note and the email address if you want to come although that there's limited space is still available because it's at the John Moore Lounge at the club next Wednesday at half past six, is RSVP at ltdsa.co.uk. So that's a lot of letters, so obviously we'll put that in there as well. Uh, you can use that link as well, because as well as if, if it does get full or if you're unable to make the trip for health or any other reasons on that Wednesday night, we will have a Teams link that you can request either through that email or when you go through the event, the Eventbrite link. So, and that Teams link will be open. We will also have a Q&A after the main EGM with Gary Sweet. He'll be doing a presentation on disabled facilities at Power Court, potential ones at Power Court. And then I will be running a, <laughs> yours truly, you'll be running, hosting a question and answer section on disabled facilities both at Kenilworth Road and potentially at Power Court and we will have time hopefully Gary said it'll be time for questions from the floor like I say it will be purely on disabled issues obviously but we will have the Teams Link open and hopefully that you'll be you if you are at home on the Teams Link and want to send a question we'll have someone manning the, the chat box of that who can hopefully feed it to me for the Q&A section have you Got any insight yet as to uh, the situation at Power Court, or is it going to be sort of a fact finding mission on the night? Yeah, well, we as an association have been throughout the process have had discussions with them on things you might be we might be able to do at the new ground that we obviously can't because the Kenny's <laughs> hundred odd years, hundred and whatever how many years old I lose count, and it was built in an area where stadiums didn't think anything of disabled issues. And obviously a huge part of what we do as an association is to try and make the best of our lot. And we've had some issues this year, obviously where we have a lot of fan bases who just have never been to a stadium like this before because they've been a 
support of a Premier League club their entire life. And so we do do have conversations with other associations. Listen, this is the situation. Understand it. We're doing our best. But it's, and but yeah, it'll be interesting to see what we've got lined up, Power Court. It won't be a complete surprise to all of us because we've been all of us have been on the board because we've been in discussions throughout. But these things update all the time, as we've seen from the fact that Gary's updated the plans for the entire stadium. So we'll be interested to see what it is. Mm. And like I say, some of the things, hopefully, he might be able to find things that he can transpose to the current ground. I mean, there's every hope that that they'll come up with some good solutions. That they've got safe standard in at Kenneth Road already, haven't they? So um, yeah, it's, it's, hopefully it's uh, very promising for you. Yep, we wish you well with the AGM. That's Wednesday, 6th of March, 6.30pm in the John Moore Lounge, which is a lovely um, room. We host our own AGM there for anyone watching that went to our AGM in November. Uh, you see all the shirts of all of the sort of international players and everything else in there. So um, tea and drink, bar available, bar opens, you know? The bar is planning to, we planning to have the bar available, whether we, we're still in discussions about whether we'll shut it while the business of the meeting or the Q and A will be going on, but there's certainly be opportunities to have drink. There will be biscuits on arrival. I am aware of that. So there's definitely going to be tea and coffee to go with that as well. So there are refreshments available of all types. Uh, Excellent. Just a reminder, if you are attending card facility only at Kenworth road these days, uh, no cash. So if you do want to drink from the bar, bring your card along with you. Wish you well with that and everything that the Disabled Supporters Association do. Steve, thanks very much for coming on and promoting um, your association and, of course, your AGM. Uh, and as I say, best of luck going forward. And, of course, we'll stay in contact and uh, support you in any way that we can, mate. Thank you. That's it for this episode of the podcast. Thanks to Steve for joining us. Thanks to James for reflecting on tough night at the office but not one that we should dwell too much on i think it's fair to say thank you to you for watching or for listening however it is that you've consumed this podcast just before we finish the night before uh, the disabled supporters agm the trust annual quiz will take place inside the eric morkham suite 7 p.m tuesday 5th of march there are just one or two tickets left available so if you want to be there to test your general knowledge on a fun evening make sure you head to the link that's on our website or social feeds and get your ticket for that tuesday 7 p.m always a fun night Thanks to the Hightown Club for hosting our studio as always, to Sean Grant and the Wolfgang for our intro music and to Ed Smith Creative for all the designs that you see on set. Until next time, which will be a preview of a huge Premier League clash against Aston Villa. Come on, you atters. This, this tech, you know what I love about this town is actually you. Everyone in it has got this massive soul. We're looting people. And that's-